Uh, this is a three-year-old male child who came to us with recurrent LRTI since birth. And there is also a history of NICU admission for respiratory distress. And uh, since then, multiple admissions for the same. Uh, these are the X-rays. And we have also done a CT scan for this child. Uh, these are the routine blood investigations. So we have diagnosed it as uh, right hemida from eventration. And the plan will be a thoracoscopic repair for this child. No, I think he is doing a laparoscopic repair. Sorry, sorry, laparoscopic repair. Yeah, yeah. Steve, the position of the baby is the same as you had for the fundoplication? Yes. Okay. So we're underneath the omenum. Yeah. And yeah, we'll get it out of the way. Okay. All right. So this is uh, kind of a long telescope, but well, you can so just to see what happens when you use small children in long telescopes. I don't know if you can see. Look at look at me in the scope. Look at me in the scope. Oh yes, yeah, so you are so far away from me. I can't. Me. I can't get. I can't get to the baby. Yeah, that's so right. So it's very important, I think, in in children to have short scopes. All right. So. So there's a, we're going we're gonna to be operating up above the liver. And so we'll put our operating ports up. There we go. So, you know, it's almost, it's a very thin membrane. It's almost a hernia. But we'll plicate it and see what it looks like. Okay. So again... Um, you know, I kind of figure out where I'm going to put my ports, and then I just put them in. And you want to make sure that you're right at your, since I'm trying to triangulate the so up here, so I, you can see my two ports are at right angles. So, a couple things I like about this. One is that even though we're sewing up at an angle, you can see we have great exposure to see what we need to see. Um, I think the difficult thing about doing a, an eventration thoracoscopically is you're just sort of fixed. Can I have that three millimeter, the three millimeter cap? So you can see I've, I've straightened the needle out some. Hopefully that's enough to go through the port. You grab it behind the instrument with a three millimeter instrument. Okay, we'll see, and it goes through. Uh, of course, the nice thing about using a five scope in a smaller kit is you get great light. And then what I do is I just go up and crack the surface tension, pull it down, and just get a bite of anything that you can. Can I have the table up some? Okay, turn the pressure down to like 10. Just take a few bites. Can I have the table up some? Good, thanks. So unfortunately, th this does waste a lot of suture because you basically get one, one suture out of every. Uh, From port. Out of every. Both both ends are there. You want to tie it and push it. So to tie these intracorporeally would be very difficult because there's a huge amount of tension on it. But extracorporeally, um, with a knot pusher, it's pretty simple. Yep, that's what's afraid of. The 3 -0. So the 3 at the bond, you, unfortunately, is not strong enough. 2 do you have anything well, we can try? The problem with silk is it doesn't slide as well with a knot pusher. Proline. Well, we'll try. We can use proline, too. Yeah, we were, I was just going to ask you, what about proline? Yeah, proline is okay. We'll try. The best, I think, for this is at the Ethabon, but you need at least a 2-0 Ethabon. 
This is uh, this is three zero silk. Two zero. Two zero silk. Okay. We'll see how it works. But I I think you you know you already kind of get the idea. So silk doesn't slide very well with a knot pusher. We'll see what it does. We can once we get some of the tension off, we probably can use a the ethabond, but yeah. That works okay. Yeah. But at the bond, really, is the best. Yep, see? Like this. There's nothing, you know, there's nothing um, very elegant or finesseful about this, so you want big, heavy suture. Well, it's borderline. It's, it's kind of, you know, the question is, is this a hernia or is it a uh, eventration? But I think as we, we, it looks like it's actually attenuated muscle kind of up here. I'm not sure it really matters because I think the tissues are good enough that we can use them to reef it down. Maybe this time we'll just take <coughs> two bites. Not pusher. Yeah, you know, it's just a none of the sutures work as well with a knot pusher as uh, at the bung. But you can see it's it's pretty quick and efficient. Um, other than the suture issues, you know, I'd I'd pretty much be done by now. And there's not anything very scientific or elegant about how to put the stitches in. Just kind of take the tension down. Uh, you know, you you can give the, because we're using a needle stick, you know, the patient might get a little bit of a pneumothorax, but it's usually not an issue. You just see how much easier at the bond slides down. So we'll we'll need a number of more of these to Steve, if you look at the uh, uh, the picture of the diaphragm there, medially it appears there is some muscle of the uh, diaphragm medially. Yeah. Towards the falciform ligament. Right. Are you going to bring that down? Yes. Okay. Right. Okay. I've been concentrating a little bit more on the suture than the. Uh, the anatomy. Yeah, but we will, we will go after it. Okay. But you know, initially, I, you know, what I do is I just put suture over suture. It's a little wasteful, but the goal is to just, um, you know, to tighten it up. So I don't, it doesn't, it doesn't, I don't worry too much about the initial stitches, 
And then you can see, try to show you here. But, you know, one of the big questions is, you know, could you work over the liver? And I think you can see that it's very easy to work over the liver. If we were having problems, what I would do is when I was tying this down, I would just have my assistant push the liver down like that. Yeah. So, you know, I, I think it's fine to do it thoracoscopically as well. Again, the advantage, you know, these are already kids who have some degree of of uh, respiratory compromise so you don't enter their chest. Um, you know, you can see it very well. It's pretty simple. Um, there's nothing real elegant about it, but it, it uh, you know, I just think it's a, it's a nice technique. And as we progress, you'll see we can get the diaphragm pretty flat. Steve, how often do you use a mesh for this? For if, knee if ventration, never. Never, okay. Well, for a hernia? Uh, you know, it, when I need to. It, I, I probably, in our, you know, just because of how it's, they've shown up, um, I'd say 10% of the time. Okay. But I think, you know, some people suggest that, you know, people who have higher recurrence rates do so because they, they're not putting, they're putting in the repair under tension or they're not using enough um, you know, they're not using a big enough patch. Okay. So, you know, it, and that, there's certainly people who have more experience than I do just in repairing diaphragms and doing that, but it, I, gu I guess if you're going to put in a patch, make sure that you put one in that's uh, big enough so that there is no tension. What, what do you use? You use a dual mesh, Gore-Tex? I've been using Gore-Tex. I've, I've used... Um, uh, what's it called? Marlex uh, Proline. No, um, it's one of the biosynthetics. Um, oh, okay, okay. The SIS. Yeah, SIS. Okay. So I've used that a couple times. I used I used that once in an abdominal wall defect. Okay. And it got terribly infected, and it took me a year to get rid of it. So I'm not quite as excited about SIS as I have been. Um, but you know that may not be fair. It may be fine. Have you done any of these uh, uh, diaphragmatic hernia repairs on ECMO when the baby was on no, ECMO? No. No, I, I, I think that's an absolute contraindication. Okay. I mean, there's no benefit. First of all, you know, I, I, don't, I don't know that you should really be fixing diaphragmatic hernias on ECMO. Okay. Um, and if you do, I would certainly do it up in the unit and not, thor not with a scope. Yeah, yeah. They're all uh, highly heparinized and uh, yeah. they bleed a lot. Yeah, so I, you know, that's, I think that at some point we got to, okay, so here you can see we're just holding the liver out of the way. You know, and the other thing, I think if, if, if people are doing these and they're not completely comfortable with thoracoscopy or the anesthetists aren't crazy about the idea of letting you drop a lung, they're, they're more likely to, to go along with this. And once you get used to using a, a knot pusher, it's, um, you know, it's quite efficient. And again, the, the major disadvantage here is you're getting one stitch out of each, uh, one stitch out of each uh, suture. tension. We'll see if the stitch holds. I'm gentle. Be 
something a little more gentle than usual because I don't want to break the stitch. Uh, sure. All right, we found a 2-0 suture. Now we're talking. So you can see this is a smaller needle. This is an RB1 needle. It's a much more appropriate size to allow you to really get in there. And now I can do this. So I just sort of go from medial to lateral and then come back and do the same thing again. So the biggest disadvantage here is that, you know, you're working against the CO2, whereas in the chest the CO2 would be pushing the diaphragm down for you. Here you've got to work against it. But it's really not, it's not that much pressure. And then again, once you, you have the right suture and we're not having to bend needles, it's much quicker. And I didn't get a chance to, to see the thoracoscopic ones, but I... Um, I assume that, you know, it's the same kind of thing of reefing in the tissue. Uh, at least that's what I used to do when I'd do them thoracoscopically. I'd just, you know, multiple bites, multiple layers. And I've, I, having done, I've done this in, in a child when I looked at the child's chest before we took the trocars out. I'd so corrected it that I'd actually caused some chest wall deformity and I had to take out a couple of my stitches. So you have to be a little careful with the lateral stitch. I'm amazed you guys could find so many eventrations. Must be a, a dem a, an epidemic in India. Of this year pulled in yeah. for this workshop. Yeah. Anytime you want me to come do four or five lobes, just let me know. So you, now we're starting to get a little bit tight. We've actually done a, a significant amount of the repair. As I said, it's very easy to actually overcorrect. Huh? Did you assess the, the correct, um, the correction is well corrected or not on the table before the... i just looking at it. I don't get an x-ray or anything. Okay. I kind of tell by how tight it feels. And you look at the just cage and... Um, yeah. The question was, do I get an x-ray or something on the table to tell how good the repair is, and I don't. I just kind of look at how flat the diaphragm seems and how much tension. And you know, it's not going to be perfect. You know, I think as you're learning to suture, if you're doing things like a Nissen, it's okay to use a knot pusher to do the stitches that are under tension. Like the, it's okay, I think it's okay, I can get it. Like a, um, the curl stitch or other stitches to you get your comfort level up. 
and then practice on the stitches that aren't under tension. But I think you definitely want to learn how to suture um, intracorporeally because if you're going to do things like toff repairs or duodenal atresias or, or other cases like that, you've got to be able to suture laparoscopically intracorporeally. But the first toff repair I did, I actually tied all the knots extracorporeally and used the knot pusher. It wasn't the prettiest thing in the world, but it worked. All of them were extracorporeally, yeah. I wasn't good enough to suture. I didn't, in that space, intracorporeally, I didn't think. I think we're about done. Generally try not to put the liver in the repair. Some came undone. Yep. So this time we're going to hold the liver down. Hello. Yes. Would someone in the OT show the suture foil to us, please? What is the size of the needle and the suture material you use? It's a 2 0 suture, and the needle is a. What material is this? It's a ethy bond. Ethy bond, is it? Yeah. yeah. Ethy bonds are usually green colored. It looks white. <laughs> yeah, I've never seen white ethy bond before. Yeah, exactly. It's nice. <laughs> so, I, you know, I, I put five or six throws in these since I'm doing it extracorporeally. Obviously, as we bring the diaphragm down, then the liver gets more and more in the way. If you're really having trouble, you can always put in another instrument through a stab wound up high. And you can grab the, hold the liver down while you're putting your sutures in. The other thing I like doing about this way, you know, if you're coming from above, I'm always a little worried that I've stuck something through the diaphragm um, in the abdomen that I can't see. And here you don't have to worry about that. Dr. Rothenberg? Yes. There was a needle pass which was shown in the last IPEG at Hawaii. Uh, could you elaborate that for the uh, application of the diaphragm by somebody? I don't remember. There was what? A kind of a uh, pa uh, suture passer for the, through the thoracic uh, for a. Uh, oh. Yeah, I, I don't. I don't remember. I remember what you're talking about, yeah. but I don't. I don't remember. Um, people have used all sorts of tricks. Um, trying to remember what that was. But you know, I, I I generally like to keep things pretty simple. If you don't. If you don't need a lot of special equipment and tricks, then you can pretty much do anything, anytime, anywhere. So the diaphragm is feeling fairly taut. I not quite get my last knot down. Yeah. I didn't quite get the last throw down, so I was just tightening it a little bit. Through the suture, the scissor is really a multitasking tool. I think I got it. Wow. I don't know if I can use that. It's a neat needle, though. We'll try. It's a test. I don't know what it looks like. Looks dangerous. But you can uh, hopefully the other thing you can see is that all my suturing is just my wrist. My arms and hands aren't moving, and so when you put needles through tissues, just like an open surgery, you want it to all be wrist. And I think people have a tendency um, when they operate laparoscopically to use their arms and hands to manipulate the ne needle, and you really want it's all just wrist. 
And if your arms are tired after suturing, it means you're you're using you know you're using your arm muscles too much. Should be a very simple, easy motion. You have to be sure to get it all the way down. Yeah, I mean, yeah. Well, I do to check the dot. Yeah, to check the, where it looks like. Yeah. Question was, do I get an X-ray? And yeah, I do. I do just to see where the diaphragm is. I, I if there's a little bit of a pneumothorax, I don't do anything. You Dr. Know. Rothenberg. Yes. The anterior portion of the diaphragm, just above the suture line, yes. seems to be very weak and seems to be ballooning out. Yeah. Would you be concerned concerned about that? No, because, because the liver protects it. Okay. And I'm and if you look, that's right on the costal margin. So if I try to yeah, yeah, through yeah. that, exactly, it'll, it'll just tear through. Okay. So I think I think we have a good repair. I think you're right. I think that part is a little bit weak. Okay. But I think that it probably won't be significant. Okay. Right. So let's go take a look. So that's pretty taut. You maybe do a little bit more. Yeah, right. And here, I, you know, we can, we could do a little bit more, but not a lot. And here we're pretty tight. So it, you know, there's a little laxity back here, but I don't think it's significant. And let's look at the uh, other side. So just to compare, so here's that's where the diaphragm is on the good side. And this is where it is, and so we're actually lower on this side. And again, you know, there's a little laxity back here, but I'm not sure it's worth doing anything about. So I, I think I'm pretty happy with that. Any questions? Uh, we're done. Uh, technically speaking, what is the difference between thoracoscopic approach and lab? Sorry? Technically, yes. technique wise, what is the difference? I, uh, well, I, you know, again, I like this because I think you get a, you good, a good evaluation. I can really judge how much tension the diaphragm repair is under. Um, and, uh, you know, I, I, and you, it's easier to suture, actually, I think, because you, again, laparoscopically, your ports, you know, you can set it up a 45 degree angle and you're not fixed between the ribs. And thoracoscopically, you're a bit more fixed and you're, and you're kind of dealing with the diaphragm up in your face. I think it's fine. You know, I don't think it's a huge difference. I just, I think this is pretty quick and efficient. Um, you saw once we had the right suture, we were able to put in 10 stitches in, in a very short time. So, um, but I, I don't think it's a huge difference. But the rims are better appreciated thoracoscopically, the rim. Yeah, I, I mean, but again, you know, what we did is we reefed, we basically pulled all the diaphragm up anteriorly. And, I, you know, the results are the same. You'll see on the x-ray the results are the same. Thank you. So, um, and obviously if we were doing the left side, the liver wouldn't be in the way. But we were actually fairly be well behind the liver. We were pushing it down a lot. It doesn't look like that because we're looking up there with the scope with an angle looking down behind it. But we were, we were a fair way behind the liver. Dr. Rothenberg, yes. when you do a diaphragmatic hernia, do you do it the same way? Uh, I used to. I actually do most diaphragmatic. If it's, if it's an older child, I do it. It varies. Uh, the young children, we do thoracoscopically. Right. Uh, um, an older child, uh, I'll generally do them. Uh, laparoscopically because I want to bring the bowel down and, and look at, you know, they often present incarcerated. Right. So I, I'd rather be in the abdomen so I can evaluate the bowel and I'd rather be pulling the bowel down into the abdomen. Oh. The advantage, you know, the one thing that you have um, in, uh, in older kids that you don't have in newborns with a diaphragmatic hernia is you have enough abdominal domain so you can do the procedure easily. Um, and then uh, the other thing that, you know, we talked about, the recurrence rate for thoracoscopic diaphragmatic hernia repair is, is probably higher than it is for open. Okay. And part of that may be, at least in there's one series, uh, the, actually the, the, there's a large series out of New York, Columbia, 
where they actually had a very high recurrence rate um, in the order of 25%, which I, I don't quite understand, and I've not done any of those repairs with them, but it may be that when you go in thoracoscopically, you're not unfurling that posterior rim. Okay. As it, the, way, the same way that you mm. can see it when you do it laparoscopically. Right. So there may be some benefits, you know, to that approach, but I, I honestly don't know. I, th I, think, I think a thoracoscopic approach is a good approach, and unless you're having, specifically, or having complications or a higher recurrence rate, I wouldn't change from it, but I do think we need to evaluate what we're doing and, and be sure um, it's, it's right. And suturing technique, do you do the knots intracorporeally or extracorporeally? For diaphragmatic hernia? Yeah, hernias. I, I do them intracorporeally. Right. That is thoracoscopic approach. What yeah. about like, when you do it laparoscopically, do you still do the... No, if it's laparoscopically, again, because it's very hard to, to suture, la su to tie intracorporeally under tension at mm. that extreme angle. Right. So there I, I do it extracorporeally. Extracorporeally. Yeah. Okay. So, I mean, it's, it's just different. And I'm not, I honestly don't, I don't think it makes a big difference one way or the other. I just, I started doing eventrations this way and I think it's a nice, easy technique. So I, I've kept doing it. I don't, I don't have a compelling reason to right. switch to do it in the chest. Yeah. And again, many of these kids have respiratory compromise, which the diaphragmatic hernias do as well. But, you know, th when you're doing a diaphragmatic hernia in an infant, they're, you, you're really just going into an open space. You're not collapsing the lung or doing anything because right. they're already collapsed. When you do it in a child who's got respiratory compromise and collapse the lung, the anesthetist gets a little more n nervous, but it, it doesn't, I don't think it makes a big difference. Well, thank you so much, Dr. Ersenberg. We really enjoyed your surgery. Good. It was a wonderful exposition. Thank you. Uh -huh. Thank you. <laughs>